Good morning, 9.30 service. Are you ready? Yes. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm ready. I'm ready. To the neighbor you just ignored because you don't like them as much and say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Hey, we're continuing in our Roman series. We're going to be in Romans chapter 6, so if you have your Bible, you can turn there. We'll be there in just a moment. But if you're taking notes this morning because note takers are world changers, you can title it, Never Getting Back Together from the very own Taylor Swift. One of my favorites. Don't judge me. Never getting back together. Hey, it is January, and I want to know, how many people did a New Year's resolution this year? Any, any people do New Year's resolution? Um, I think there's probably more, but be honest with me. Tell the truth. Shame the devil. New Year's resolution, you made one, and you already broke it. Anybody in here? I see your hands. All right, there it is. There was more hands that went up for that than went up for saying that they made a New Year's resolution. How many have ever made a New Year's resolution? Ever made it? Okay, okay, there it is. So what I've noticed is that New Year's resolutions many times uh, are focused about me, right? I want to eat healthy. I want to work out more. I want to do this. It's focused on things that I want to change. And I want to ask you this morning, is there something in your life that you wish that you could change? I'm sure for many it is yes, and maybe for some it is a sin that you have in your life. There, there's some sin that's going on that you've been stuck in, and you're like, man, I wish that I could change this sin. And this morning, we're in Romans chapter 6, and it kind of leads to this question that many people have, which is this, can you be a Christian and continue to live in sin? Can you be a Christian and continue to live in sin. And maybe sin is the thing that you want to change. Maybe you've given your life to Jesus and that has changed. And now you have a testimony saying, man, I once had this addiction. I once had this struggle, but, but look at what God has done and, and now I'm here. And maybe you've noticed this, but what I found with, with a lot of people when they share a testimony is lots of times it's very focused on the, the BC, the before Christ point of their life, right? And it's, it's like, oh man, back in the day, you should have seen me back in the day. It was, it was crazy. Like the things that I would do, the places I would go, the things I would say, man, those, those were some crazy times. And then, but then Christ came in and yeah, I'm, I'm living for Jesus now. And it's like, it's almost like reminiscing in the past, like, oh, I wish I could go back to all that, but, but Jesus came in and yeah. And it's like a 95% BC and 5% since Christ. But really what I want you to see this morning is that when Jesus comes into your life and you have this true transformation and you're truly in love with Jesus and you experience the love, the joy, the peace that comes from him, like that's all you'll wanna talk about. And the things from the past, the, the old life, is like why did I ever even want to do that? You see, being a Christian, accepting Jesus is like winning the lottery and going back to sin is like moving into poverty. Can you imagine winning the lottery and going into poverty? This week I, I was looking at some, some articles of some lottery winners. And there's articles of someone who won a million dollars and a year and a half later were arrested for robbery. Or people that have, have won the lottery and now are filing for bankruptcy and you're just thinking like, man, if only I could have that money, I would invest it, I would save it, I would be good to go. Like how crazy can you be that, that you got that much money and now that's where you are in your life? But don't judge them too quickly because Paul's asking us the same thing. How can you receive Jesus have this transformation and experience the love, the joy, the peace, the hope that comes from him, and then turn back and go to sin. It's like winning the lottery and, and living in poverty. But in chapter six, he's saying, don't look back. You're, you never get back together with your sin. The old life is gone, the new life has begun. So we're in Romans chapter six, and we're gonna start in verse one. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through the baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may, may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. 
For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Jesus, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you that you came from heaven down to earth to die for our sin, that that we don't have to live in sin, but we can bury our sin and that we can have resurrection life like you have and we can live in that life today. I pray you'd speak through me, open up our hearts and our ears to hear what you have to say to us and we welcome your spirit. In your name we pray, amen. So the first thing we see here in, in chapter six is Paul's call of getting away to sin, and he, and he calls us to do the first thing, if you're taking notes, is get up. Get up. In, in your sin, get up. He says in verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. He begins with this question. Shall we continue to sin so that we can experience more grace? Because grace feels good, so, so can I just keep sinning so I can feel that, that grace? And lead up to this point in Romans, uh, as we've gone through this series, we have seen that we are all sinners, right? Raise your hand in the room if you are a sinner. If you are not raising your hand or someone around you is not raising your hand, they are a sinner or they are Jesus, I don't know, one or the other. But we've noticed that, that none of us are righteous, right? We're, we're, we're all sinners. And it presents this idea that Jesus came from heaven down to earth to die for our sins so that we could be made new in this process called justification, which we learned is just as if I had never sinned. And now we're looking at what does justification look like in a believer's life. So Paul presents this question, can I go on sinning so that grace might continue? And he's not asking this question because he's curious about it. He's asking this question because he knows there's someone in the audience that's going to ask the stupid question that he just is answering, right? Because we all know there's such thing as stupid questions, right? If you don't agree that there are stupid questions, then you are the one that has the stupid questions, I'm guessing. But he's saying if, if there aren't things that I have to do to get to heaven, if, the, if it's not about my, my works, and God's grace is constant, and through him I am justified, can't I just keep sinning so I can continue to experience Grace. He's asking, is grace a hall pass for me to continue to sin? Notice a key word in there, what I said, for me to continue to sin. Continue. If you're taking notes, write that word down. Continue. Because he's not saying, man, if, I'm, if, if you get saved by grace, if you receive Jesus, then you're never going to sin again. He's not saying that you're not going to make mistakes, that you're not going to fall into a temptation, but there's a difference between making a mistake and continuing to sin. Continuing to sin is telling me I never left my sin. I, I, I'm living in my sin, and a lot of people, that's what they want. I want to I wanna continue doing this life that I have of sin, but I also want to experience the grace, so I'm just going to live in it, and I'm just going to keep asking for forgiveness. I'm going to continue in my life of sin. It's like this example. Let's say that you wanted to buy a new house. All right, so you thought about it for a while. You talked with your spouse about it, and you said, yep, we've outgrown the house that we're in right now. It's time that, that we look for a new house. So you go to the bank, and, and you get approved for a loan, and, and you get your house assessed, and you know how much your house is worth, how much you can sell it for, and you start doing research on what kind of house you want, aka you watch HGTV a whole lot, and you know this is exactly what I want and this is the neighborhood that I wanna live in, and, and you start looking at houses in that neighborhood, and, and you go to open houses, right? And you find the house that you want. Like it's everything that you could ever want. It's, it's the perfect size, the perfect amount of land, it's got every single checkbox on your list. And you're like, this is the house that we need to get. So you ask how much, and just like any house that you would ever want, it's gonna be way more than you can afford, right? And you're like, oh man, we can't, we can't afford this, and you, and you try to figure out like, maybe we can sell this, or maybe we can cut back on this, and you know, this is not possible for us to live here. Then someone overheard you talking, and they come up and say, hey, you know what, I heard you talking that this is the house you want, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna buy it for you, and give it to you. And you're like, oh my goodness, thank you so much, this is amazing, and you just have this brand new house that's purchased for you, and then you realize, ah oh, man, now I gotta pack. I don't know if I wanna do that. Got to get rid of stuff, got to change some stuff because that stuff doesn't fit my new house. And like, you know what? 
that's too much work. I'm just going to continue living in my old Because it's comfortable. Like, I'm comfortable in my old house. But then certain friends come in town, and you want them to see your new beautiful house. You say, hey, look at, look at this house. Look at my new house. Isn't it, isn't it beautiful? How often do we do that in our walk with Christ? Or this new house, this, this new life has been purchased and given to us that we, we couldn't earn it, I couldn't pay for it. There's nothing I could do to get it, but Jesus gave it to me. And because I, I'm comfortable in my sin, I'm comfortable in my old life, I, I just stay in that old house. And I get around people that, that I wanna show them, man, I, I'm doing great with God. Look at my relationship with Jesus. Look at this house that I got, this new house. But I don't make the jump to it. We're, we're, we're stuck in sin. We, we have this love for sin. Has anyone in here ever heard of the Stockholm Syndrome? The Stockholm Syndrome? In 1973, in Stockholm, Sweden, there was this bank robbery. And for six days, two men held four people hostage uh, in this bank while they negotiated with the law enforcement. During those six days, the craziest thing happened. During the standoff, the victims became emotionally attached to their captors. They, they, they became attached to the people that were holding them hostage, so much so that when the government, when, when law enforcement came in to rescue them, they didn't want to be rescued. When the case went, went to the court, they went and they defended them in court. So much so that, that they raised money to pay for these people's defense. They fell in love with their captors. They did not want to be set free. And so many of us were like, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. You were held hostage. These people did not care one bit about you, but you are defending them. How often is that us with sin? That I, I'm, I'm held prisoner in sin. I, I'm held hostage to the sin. And Jesus came in and he saved me. His grace came in and he's saying, guess what? I have paid the price. You no longer have to be hostage. I'm coming in to rescue you. Say, ah, but my sin isn't, isn't that bad. Oh, but, but this is a fun lifestyle that I live in. Saying, get up. You're no longer stuck in that sin anymore. Many of us are so in love with our sin that when Jesus brings freedom, we reject it because this is comfortable for me. This is easier for me. He says, shall we go on sinning by no means? He says, how can we who die to sin live in it any longer? How can you have a relationship to sin? I'm asking you, how can you have a relationship with sin when you are dead? How can you have a relationship when you're dead? You say, I'm not dead. You are dead. If you are a Christian, a follower of Jesus, we have died to ourselves. We have died to sin. And it's impossible to be alive and be dead in the same thing. You cannot be alive and dead in it. If you are alive and dead in sin, then you are a sin zombie, right? And I don't see a bunch of sin zombies walking around. It, it, in the message version, it says this in verse 2. If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? We left. We're gone. That's no longer the place that we live. We moved away. We're dead to sin. Happy Sunday, everyone. You are dead. That's encouraging, right? Like, sweet, I'm dead. But that should encourage us. There's good news because in verse five it says, for if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in resurrection like his. We are dead, but through Christ we are now alive. Understand there is nothing you can do to receive that salvation. Nothing you can do. No matter how good you are, no matter how many good deeds you do, no matter how much money you give to the church, you will continue to fail. You will fail every single time. You will get an F on every test, every report card, for every year. Fail. Continue. On our own, we fail. But there's good news. That God's gift for us does not come to us based on what we have done for him, but what he has already done for us. The gift of salvation isn't about what I can do, but what he has already done. He doesn't care that you got an F on the report card. He said, guess what? I'm gonna go and I'm gonna take the test for you and I'm gonna give, the grade, I'm gonna give you the grade that I got. He came in and he's taking it for us. And the fact that Jesus did this for us should revolutionize our life. It should change everything. 
change what we do, change how we live. Understand that holy living does not produce salvation, but salvation does produce holy living. It's not what I'm doing that produces my salvation, it's that I was saved, that, that now that changes what I do, changes everything. Salvation for us is like this reset. It's a reset on our life. Because before, sin is the default in our life. We are born sinners, and, and, and we're consumed with that. And maybe anyone here ever had to do like a hard reset on a phone or a computer or something like that, right? Like you get a virus on your phone, and uh, you have to like walk through the steps that it tells you to do to fix your phone, and then like you have to do a death grip on your phone in order to like get it to get to the right spot. It's weird, I don't get it, but it's kind of awesome. Like you have this power. But it's like this hard reset. And if your phone is super messed up, you take it to the store and they look at it and they're like, yeah, this is really bad. Here's a brand new phone. They're like, this is the best day ever. I just got a brand new phone. Guess what? That is Jesus. That is salvation. That, that I was so full of all of this stuff. I was, I was so consumed by sin that I couldn't do anything, that, the, that I couldn't reset it myself. So I took it in and Jesus says, here you go. Here is a new life. Here is a new phone. That is something to be excited about. That's something to celebrate. That the old is gone and it is brand new through him. We're made new. And look what happens in 1 John. It says, no one who is born of God will continue to sin. Or I love the New Living Translation. It says, those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning. Once again, this is not saying when you receive salvation, you're not going to sin anymore. It's, it's that you're not going to continue. It's not, you're not going to live in it. You're not going to practice sinning. Anyone here ever been on a sports team or maybe your kids played sports? You know that every sports team, every good sports team, does what? Practice, right? They practice, and we know that practice, it makes perfect, and maybe that's a couple hours a week, maybe that's a couple hours a day that they're practicing so that when it's game time, whatever they're practicing naturally happens. How many of us have been practicing sin? Have been continuing to sin, so in our day-to-day -day life, if we're practicing to sin, what comes out? Sin. But, but Paul leads to something here, and, I, and this is something that I want you to catch that he's talking about. In verses 3, 6, 9, and 16, it says, Or don't you know? For we know. For we know. Don't you know? He's, he's talking about know, to have knowledge, meaning the way to Christian living is Christian learning. You want to live for Christ, so you have to learn what the Word says. You have to practice what he is telling us to do. And I believe that one of Satan's greatest tactics is to make us ignorant of what the Bible says. That, oh man, I had this awesome moment with God at church, and, and that's good for me. And I don't, I don't need to necessarily, I, I'm busy, I, I don't have time to, to get in my Word. I don't have time to read what, what God says about this, but I'm going to go to church and maybe I'm going to listen to my favorite preacher on YouTube at some point during the weekend, and, and that's good for me. But he's saying you need to know, you need to, to practice. It's time we stop continuing to practice, to continue to live in sin and start practicing righteousness. Start practicing holy living, putting his playbook into practice. So number one, we see that we need to get up, and number two is that we need to go forward. Going forward. Verse three it says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Talking about baptism. The, the old way of life, it, it's gone. We, we've gotten out of our sin. And now we see that, that we're going forward. That's what baptism is all about. It's, a, it's an outward expression of an inward doing. And it's a symbolization that as you go under the water, symbolizing the burial, the, that you died with Christ, and as you're raised up, it's the resurrection of Christ. We become, as you receive Jesus, we become one with Christ. It's not just that I imitate Christ, it's that I am one with Christ. That when he died, I died. When he was risen, I am risen. And because of this new relationship with Jesus, we have a new relationship with sin. Because Jesus changes everything. 
When Jesus comes in, it changes everything. What Paul is saying is that we make a break with the past. We are dead to sin. I identify with the death and the burial as the death of my sin, but we're risen into a new life with Jesus. So we have to live that out. A new life, it it looks different though, doesn't it? When you think of a, a living person and a dead person, they look different. They act different. They smell different. Everything is different. In the worship team, you can come. In John chapter 11, we see the story of Lazarus. And Lazarus is dead. Jesus arrives in town. Lazarus has been dead and buried for four days. So there's no doubt he is dead. He stinks probably, right? And Jesus comes in, and by the power of Jesus' words, where he says, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus was raised to life in that moment. But then something happens. He comes to the entrance of the tomb, and at the entrance of the tomb, he's, he's still wearing the grave clothes. He, he's still wearing those, those clothes that, that defined where he was in his life, that he was dead. Imagine, me, imagine with me for one moment. He's dead for four days. Jesus comes. He's raised to life. And, and Lazarus comes out, and he's standing there. He stinks, right? He's wearing these grave clothes. What if he just decided, you know what? I don't need to take a bath. Which, if you ever want to know what that looks like, come to middle school camp sometime, right? <laughs> well, imagine he says, I don't, I don't need to, to get clean. I, I can just leave these clothes on. Like, these clothes are fine, right? That would be ridiculous. No one would want to hang out with him. No, everyone would question, what are you doing? Jesus tells him, take the grave clothes off. Take them off. Don't live in this in-between. I think there's too many Christians that are these in-betweeners. Where we're in between the cross and Jesus being risen from the dead. We're between Friday and Sunday. I, I, I like to look at what Jesus has done for me, that, that he died for my sins, and I like, to, I like to ask him for the grace and the forgiveness, and, and that's super great for me. But to live out a new life, to leave the old behind, I don't know about that. I'm just going to keep these grave clothes on. I'm not going to take a bath. I'm not going to shower. But church, did you know that, that the resurrection power of Jesus is for you today? It is for you today, and through Jesus, the salvation of Jesus, you have the authority to speak things into life. That as he has given you life, you can begin to call things out, that that he gives you his authority. It's clear that when we receive Christ, we identify with Christ. The old life, that we are dead to sin, and we're raised to enjoy the new life. And we should not want to go back into our sin, into the grave, any more than Lazarus would have wanted to go into his tomb. Can you imagine that? Jesus calls him out and he walks to the, to the front of the tomb. He says, all right, take off the grave clothes and come out. And he's like, nah, I'm just gonna hang out in here in the tomb. All right, that's, no one would do that. You have a new life. But how many of us get stuck in that where Jesus calls and he says, hey, come on out. Take off your grave clothes. Take off the sin. Take off the things that used to define you. Nah, this is comfortable for me. This is where I want to be. This is where I want to sit and stay. Understand that just like Lazarus had the choice to to take the gray clothes off and come out, you have the choice for you to come out, for you to stay in. See, sin, it's like a prison for us. And you know what? To be honest with you, what all of us deserve is we all deserve to be locked into that prison and to die in that prison. That's what we deserve. But Jesus came in and he opens up the prison door. He came in and he said, guess what? You can come out. Guess what? I have freedom for you. Will you come out? It's your choice. He's not going to force you. It says that, that he sits and he, he knocks. He's not going to do this by force, by force. It's up to you. There's a choice that comes to you to walk that out. And you know what I bet happened for Lazarus? I don't think that his testimony, once he came out and went, saw people like can you imagine that testimony like yeah remember when I died for four days that was crazy right that's a that's a crazy testimony but can you imagine if he spent 95 percent of his testimony talking about the tomb yeah so you should have want to hear what happened the first day in the tomb right and he's like 
And then the, the second day in the tomb, this is what happened. It was crazy. No, he didn't spend any time talking about what was in the tomb. He said, I was dead, but look at what Jesus is doing in me now. We walk in that new life. We don't focus on the past. We, we, we know that Jesus is calling us to more. Just as, as he died, we die to sin. Just as he was resurrected, we are resurrected and we have the authority that comes through him. So how do you respond? How are you going to choose to live with that knowledge? Maybe you're sitting here this morning saying, well, Pastor Zach, like I, I've received Jesus and, and, and all, but like I just, I can't shake it. I, I, I don't know how to, how to get past this addiction. I don't know how, how to get over this. I just keep going back. I just keep practicing. I keep continuing in that sin. It's super simple. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Fill yourself up with what is good. Think about riding a bicycle. Where do you go? Where you look, right? Your bike will go where you are looking. Or think about, do we have any Texas Roadhouse fans in the room? All right, you go to Texas Roadhouse, and you first walk in, and you're starving, right? And there's all the peanuts there, and you're like, oh my goodness, these peanuts are the greatest thing ever. They probably don't have that anymore because COVID or whatever, but... Can you imagine like that you walk in and, and you're like, oh, these peanuts are amazing. You're filling yourself up on peanuts and these are the best thing ever, right? Can you imagine if when your steak comes out, you're like, ah, these peanuts are too good. I just got to keep eating the peanuts. Forget about the steak. No, when the steak comes out, that's all you're focused on. That's all you're focused on. And when you fill yourself up with what is good, you won't want the extra things that Satan's throwing at you. When you fill yourself up with the steak, you don't want the peanuts. When you fill yourself up with Jesus, you don't want the counterfeit. Keep your eyes on Jesus. If you bow your head and, and close your eyes. This morning, maybe you're, you're hearing this for the first time about Jesus came and he died for you and now you can be dead to your sin and you can be alive in Christ. And this morning, you want to make that decision that today I want to die to my sin. Today I want to start living for Jesus, letting him take full control of my life. If that's you and you say, Pastor Zach, for the first time in my life, I want to give my life to Jesus, saying, God, I give you control. I want to die to my sin and have that resurrected power that comes from you. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Maybe you're in here and you would say, if I'm honest with myself, I've accepted Jesus, but I've, I've, I've continued in my sin. I've been practicing the sin. Like I thought I was good to just accept Jesus and then go on living and then I'll ask for forgiveness and then I'll accept Jesus and I'll, I'll, I'll go back to my sin and ask for forgiveness. And, and you, were, you were doing that for a while, but today you recognize no longer can I continue in this sin. No longer can I keep practicing the sin, but today everything needs to change. Today my focus needs to shift from the things of this world to the things of God and, and to start living a holy life. And if that's you this morning, you say, today I need to shift from continuing and, and practicing my sin to keeping my eyes on Jesus and living for him. If that's you, would you just raise your hand saying, that's me. I see the hands. The last thing is this, is this morning you would say, today I wanna to commit to keeping my eyes on Jesus. Whether it's that I'm giving up my practicing of sin and I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus, or I've, I've been on the course, but today I'm, I'm recommitting, saying, God, I'm gonna keep my eyes on you. I'm not gonna get distracted with what the world has to offer me. And as you work through me, as I died with you and now I'm resurrected with you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a living person, a living being working for your good, a light into a lost world. And I wanna keep my eyes on you. If that's you and you wanna just say, Jesus, today I wanna recommit my life, my hands up saying, I wanna keep my eyes on you. Would you just raise your hand? Say, I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pray over every person that just raised their hand this morning. And we're just gonna go into a time and, and there's some built in, a built in couple minutes here where I just want you just to, to put your focus on Jesus. Just say, Jesus, I, I, I'm coming after you with everything I got. And that I wanna experience the love and the joy and the peace that comes through you and I wanna be a light to the people around me. Jesus, I thank you 
for every person here this morning, God, for those hands that went up accepting you, recommitting their life to you, except those who are saying, I want to keep my eyes on Jesus. I pray that we would live a life that no longer do we continue in sin, no longer do we keep practicing sin, but we live a life for you, we, that we live out our faith, that we would de be dead to sin and be alive in you, and that we would see what that new life looks like. No longer would we be tempted, no longer would we want to go back to the things of the past, because we have recognized that what you have to offer is far greater than anything we could ever experience. I pray this room would be full of people that are chasing after you, that in effect that we would then be a light into a lost world to see people come to know you. We love you and we thank you. Let me pray. Amen. You know what gets me excited about that line? That my heart will sing no other name, Jesus, is that your heart needs nothing more than Jesus. That everything you could ever want, everything you could ever need is found in one person and his name is Jesus. That you don't have to go searching to fill those needs, those, those desires. You don't have to see what does the world have to offer? How does, how does this fit my needs? Jesus is everything you could ever want, everything you could ever need. And when we focus on him, when we put our eyes on him, nothing else gets in the way. And we live a life of righteousness, a holy living life that we can't do on our own. Holy living doesn't produce salvation, but salvation, it produces holy living. And no longer do I have to be stuck in the prison of sin because Jesus paid the price. Can we just give it up, just a praise to Jesus this morning for saving us, that even though I didn't deserve it, that I don't earn it, that he paid the price. I hope this morning you are challenged, you are encouraged, and that as you leave this morning, you are ready to live a life that is for Jesus, forgetting the old ways, forgetting the past, and seeing what Jesus is calling to you today. Have a blessed day.